Hey guys, sorry about the shaky cam. I'm on my cell phone at the moment, but in today's video, I'm gonna go over a few of the specialty tools that you wanna consider buying for a motorized bike build. Now, a lot of these tools are just tools that you would wanna consider having for a regular bike, whether you plan on putting a motor on it or not. But when you're putting a motor on a bike, these are tools that you're gonna find yourself needing sooner rather than later, as the extra weight, stress, and speed of a motor on a bike will cause you to, well, do adjustments, replacements, and fixes much sooner. I'm also gonna go over a few of the modifications and upgrades we did to this particular bike. They're not extensive, they're just a few things, as well as some important things that you need to check before you buy a bike from a big box store. Now, a lot of my viewers are budget guys, just like me, so you're buying a big box store bike. So what I'm gonna go over in this video is some of the things that you just basically need to look at before you leave the store with the bike. All right guys, we have a fresh build here. The motor is my old Zeta Triple Forty, the original motor on the trail bike. And she's been sitting around for a while. I replaced the clutch and clutch shaft on it a long time ago. Never got around to putting it back on a bike. So I went ahead and picked up this frame. I'm not gonna tell you exactly what frame it is. I'm gonna leave that for the comments. Whoever can guess what frame this is, will get a shout out. But first, let's go ahead and take it for a ride and make sure it's gonna work. Ain't fired this motor up in a long time. In my experience, when you're putting a motor on a bike, most of the issues that you're going to run into are with the bike itself. So I've had a few viewers ask me for tips when they're purchasing parts, bikes, motors, as well as what do I look for in a bike when I'm purchasing it, knowing that I'm going to put a motor on it. Even some viewers asked what I would have done differently on older builds, knowing what I know now. Since these questions are all similar, we're going to condense them into one video and hopefully touch on all bases. Come on, go get it. Yeah, go get it. Go get it. Now you need to make a decision and this decision is probably going to be determined by how much time you have, your available tools, and your experience level. When you look over a bike in a store and you discover some of the issues we're going to cover in this video, you need to decide whether or not you're going to fix them yourself or skip over that frame and look for a better option. Either way, this is something you need to be prepared to deal with because these are important. 
Now, for the most part, these are all things that you would normally watch out for when buying a bike, regardless of whether you're going to put a motor on it. But when you put one of these kits on a bike, these issues become amplified very quickly. So it's more important that you check them now before you leave the store. Two comments that are fueled by ignorance may pop up from time to time. The first being, why don't you just purchase a more expensive frame, spend more money on the bike, and have a higher quality build? Well, I would totally agree with this mindset. I found that it's unfortunate the higher end bikes tend to have features that get in the way of putting a motor on them. These motors are cheap and they're designed to go on cheap bikes. When you decide you want to put them on a more expensive, let's say, mountain bike frame, there's a lot of things that can get in the way and little things that just have to be modified. Generally, that's not not a big issue, but when you're modifying an $800 frame to put a $100 motor on it, you start to cringe in the back of your mind. A second comment that's bound to pop up from time to time is the individual who just grabbed any random bike, put a motor on it, did nothing to either of them, and it's run for years and hundreds of miles, or thousands even. Whereas I'm skeptical to whether or not to believe this individual who claims something like this, I will say that they are the exception and not the rule. Now you want to give the brakes a quick check, but don't spend too much time on them. I've never actually seen a big box store bike with brakes that didn't need to be adjusted. It's kind of a given. So for now, we're going to go ahead and skip over them in this video. You want to disconnect them if possible. This is easy with linear pull brakes on most mountain bikes. You're disconnecting them to get them out of the way. Then you want to pick up the bike and give that front wheel a spin. That wheel should spin free and for a long time. If it appears that the wheel's slowing down faster than it should be, kind of like something was rubbing on it, go ahead and just skip over that frame. If you really want that frame, yeah, you can get it, but you're going to need to consider the fact that the front wheel bearings are probably damaged. See, wheel bearings that are too loose can easily be adjusted and usually are not damaged, but wheel bearings that have been overly tightened from the factory, there's a good chance that some of the ball bearings have flat spots, and these will go bad very quickly. Also, a thing you don't want to feel is any vibration or grittiness through the frame. As that front wheel is spinning, you shouldn't feel anything in the frame. Then you want to set the bike down and give that front tire a shake back and forth. You shouldn't feel any clicks, no clunking, no give. It shouldn't feel loose, basically. When you move that front tire back and forth, you want it to feel like it's a solid piece of the bike and that's all. Now, if it does feel loose and you do feel little clicks, that's okay. A loose wheel bearing can easily be adjusted, but it does require a specialty tool, which we'll get into later in the video. Next, you'll want to do the same thing with the headset, basically your steering. You want to give it a few shakes back and forth on the handlebars and make sure it doesn't feel loose from the frame. This can be adjusted of course as well, but if you go to turn the bike and it's really stiff or you feel resistance, once again, you probably got an over tightened wheel bearing and that's something you might want to skip. I find the crank set not to be as important, it's the one exception. Because you're putting a motor on the bike, you're generally not going to be pedaling very much, so there's going to be very little wear and tear on the crank set. But there are a few things you still want to check. If possible, remove the chain so it can spin freely. Then give it a spin. Just like with the wheel, you want it to spin for a long time, smooth. You don't want it to feel like it's slowing down, like it's been over tightened. And then you can shake it back and forth. Grab onto the crank and give it a shake. You shouldn't feel it loose, no jiggle. Nothing like that, solid part of the bike. Once again, this is something that's easy to fix, and I do recommend using a specialty tool for it, but this one doesn't absolutely require a specialty tool to tighten. Same thing with the back wheel. The back wheel is more involved, so this is an area that if you're intimidated by doing adjustments on wheel bearings, this is the one you might want to skip onto an, an, another bike if there's an issue. There was the front wheel, the crank set, the head set, that's all easy to adjust, but the back wheel can cause you a nightmare in the future. Now, new bikes that haven't really been ridden yet are easier to work on because the freewheel has not been tightened onto the bike. 
more expensive frames will use a cassette, which is easier to remove as well, but both of these require a specialty tool to remove. This tool is cheap and easy to get, but it's just something to keep in mind. With the back wheel, you want to do exactly what you did with the front. Disconnect the brakes if possible, give it a spin. You want it to spin for a long time, as if it was free. Now the back wheel is never going to spin as long as the front because it has some slight resistance from the free wheel or the cassette, but still it should spin for quite a long time. And you don't want it to feel loose. Give it a shake, make sure it feels like a solid part of the bike, no clicks, no looseness. He's jumping over stuff, it looked like. The triangle is definitely something you need to consider, especially depending on what kind of motor you're going to use. If you're using the cheaper China dolls with the smaller lower mounting bracket, then you're going to probably not want to go with a 26 inch mountain bike. Where the motor itself will fit, you're going to have to use an adapter to fit the carburetor. That's also not the end of the world. The adapters are cheap and easy to use, but it's just a little extra clutter which I personally don't prefer. In my instance, I'm using the Zeta Triple Forty, which has the larger lower mounting bracket of 40 millimeters, and fits on this bike perfect. It is a little bit of a tight fit, but this was still easier to fit on than my Hot Shot. Next, we want to move back to the wheels and check to see if they're out of true. Now, I've never actually purchased a bike from a big box store with wheels that were perfectly trued. I have seen some that are pretty close, though. In any case, you want to make sure that the wheel is not really tweaked out of alignment. If possible, go ahead and reclamp the brakes together. You can use them as a point of reference. However, if the brakes are so severely out of adjustment that they're just going to get in the way, go ahead and leave them unclamped. You can use your finger, a pencil, a pin, a screwdriver, any point of reference held against the frame to check and see how far out of true the wheel is. You're going to spin the wheel and see how it moves from left to right, basically wobbling from side to side. Now, it's normal for these bikes to have a little bit of wobble and some high and low spots, but if you have one that bends quite severely, where common sense tells you that that's not good, you'll want to consider skipping that frame or going to work on it with some spoke truing tools. <sighs> well, I figure that wheel's been trued about as many times as it's going to be true. Pretty, uh, pretty much done. Now this is an easy process, but it is time consuming and requires you to watch some videos, get some information on how to true a wheel. It can be done on the bike, requires only one specialty tool, and in a pinch can even be done with a pair of pliers or a crescent wrench, so it's not recommended, that's only in a pinch. So by now you may have noticed that there's a main theme here that's revolving, no pun intended, around the wheels. That's because on these bikes, the main problem area is the wheels, more particularly the rear wheel. Half of the problems I've had on a motorized bike have been the rear wheel. In most situations, it's been like this in mine every time, when purchasing a bike, you can turn around in the aisle immediately on the rack and see the Goodyear heavy duty inner tubes. Now you can use any brand you like, but get some heavy duty inner tubes. The Goodyear ones have been holding up for me pretty nice. They're at least twice as thick as a standard inner tube. They're heavier, but since the motor is doing all the work, that's not a big deal. They're more resistant to punctures, but more importantly, what I have run into in the past is not necessarily punctures. It's actually uh, inner tube fatigue. I've had my inner tubes on the rear wheel actually just tear themselves apart from the inside out. Maybe from the added torque, the hammering of the motor, imperfections in the rim, you name it. But I've had the cheap inner tubes pretty much just split down the seams time and time again on several different bikes. So there's another issue which we need to go ahead and take care of to make sure that even our heavy duty inner tubes don't become fatigued and shred. What I like to do is take the tire off as soon as I get to the house and examine the rim. 
Go ahead and run your hand along the inside of the rim, the bottom and both edges. You don't want to feel any sharp cuts, no burrs, no nothing like that. Basically, if anything is sharp enough to cause your finger pain, then it's sharp enough to cut through the rubber. You want to take some sandpaper, Dremel if you need to, and just go over the rim in any spots that feel like they could cause a tear in the inner tube. You want to make sure that the liner on the rim is there. Some bikes don't come with rim liners and it's literally just the inner tube up against the spoke nipples. That's not good. Especially because some of these are put on hastily and they get stripped or burrs on the screws themselves. If you don't have an inner liner on your bike or the one you do have does not inspire confidence, you can consider using what I use, the half gorilla duct tape rolls. Basically it's duct tape that's one inch thick pre-cut rolls. They're perfect for this situation. I run two layers of that on the inside of my rim. I'll even replace in most cases the rim liner that comes on these cheap bikes because it's paper thin in some instances. This stuff is really good. It sticks well, lasts a long time, and is resistant to the elements. Okay, I'm going to tweak with the spokes real quick, see if I can get it to stop rubbing. At least the motor feels like it's running better than it was yesterday. This motor. As mentioned, I replaced the clutch, the clutch shaft, and the clutch bearing. When I ordered that shaft at the time, I didn't know that there are two different shafts they use on these motors. There might be more, but I found out there's at least two of them when I ordered this one. The original shaft that came out of this 4040 had wider keyways. The little keyways that keep the gears and um, sprocket from slipping were wider on the shaft for the 4040. The shaft that I ordered had thin keyways. I assume it was a cheaper shaft. So I had to take a key and shave it down to make it fit in that shaft because I couldn't find a keyway thin enough. My concern is that this motor is going to strip out that key eventually and uh, it's going to happen when we're on a trail. I won't know, but what I'm going to try and do is push this motor and bike pretty hard on some of these roads, especially going uphill. Give it as much torque as I can because if that keyway is going to strip out, I want it to do it here at the house, not on a trail when I'm trying to get through some mud. Alright guys, so forgive the mess and the poor lighting conditions. We've been working on a couple of bikes for the past two days. 
But right now I want to go over some of the specialty tools that you can expect to use on these bikes. Uh, at some point, if you get serious into motorized bikes, you're going to need these parts one way or another or else your life is just going to be a headache. First off, get yourself a set of spoke truing tools. Now this is going to be a little different depending on the bike you use, but the majority of big box store bikes use these special little sockets to remove the freewheel. You can get this. Now I'm not going to be able to tell you which one you need. What you're going to have to do is just look up the uh, freewheel removal tool and then try and match it to your bike best you can. But if you're going to do any work to the rear wheel, having one of these is going to help you a lot for repacking bearings, um, adjusting loose bearings, um, and replacing your freewheel if that ever happens, if you ever need to do that. Um, but keep in mind that removing this freewheel without a socket and a big pry bar on the end of it is really difficult on a bike that's already been used. Okay, you might get lucky, but brand new bikes, you can usually remove these free wheels really easy. They just unscrew right off. And it is lefty loosey righty tighty. Um, and then you can put it back on by hand and let the pedaling from the chain tighten it back up for you. Okay, but uh, if you're planning on using one of these on a bike that's old or it's been ridden a lot, uh, you're going to need a socket that fits over it and you're going to need a long pry bar, okay, because it can take a lot of force to undo that after you've been pedaling it tight for uh, who knows how long, especially if it's got rust. In some cases, some of these can get stuck on there so bad that you're simply going to have to just trash the, the hub and the rim. This is not a big necessity. I'm just getting this out of the way. Every kit I've ever purchased comes with one of these. This is a gear puller with a couple different sizes for doing a couple different jobs. This is an upgraded one that's I guess made out of a little bit better material the threads are stronger or whatever if you want a set of low profile wrenches these are very important for doing any work to the wheel bearings and the hubs this is I believe it called a spanner wrench it's for the lock ring on the cranks of most bikes this one will work this one's made by park tool okay and it locks onto this little ring this ring does the exact same thing as that nut does. It locks the inner nut in place. I guess you'd call it the cone. But you'd loosen this ring, and then you could tighten or loosen this inner, we'll just call it a bolt, to either loosen or tighten your crank bearings. Right here, make sure you have at least one ratcheting 10 millimeter. Okay, and one regular 10 millimeter. And this one came way too long, and I ended up stripping the first few threads on this smaller bolt. So what I did, because the uh, most of the threads were still good, so this is still a good tool, is I went ahead and took my Dremel, and I cut off about a half an inch of this stupidly long punch. Um, I guess that means in some situations on bigger chains I might not be able to use it, but this is only for my motorized bikes. So I don't need it that long. All I need it to do is come in about this tight. So if you get one of these cheap ones, you may want to consider measuring it up against one of your chain links, okay, just to make sure that it will push the pin all the way through and then cut off the excess. That way you won't strip out the threads on this cheap tool, because it's a cheap tool. All right, so you're going to need a chain breaker. Everybody knows that, but that's just a tip if you get one of these uh, cheap ones. Also on this one, this platform here that the chain sits on was uneven. It was like there was extra material on one side. Um, it looked like it was supposed to be there, but it just kept turning the chain and I couldn't punch the pin out. So I took my Dremel to this as well and shaved it down. Okay. Speaking of Dremels, you are at some point in on motorized bike stuff, either for a tool, a bolt, a nut, a specialty part, getting something out of the way. You are going to need a Dremel at some point in time. I think I got this one for around $25 at Walmart, okay? It's a basic Dremel, but it, you don't need anything fancy, you just need a Dremel. Um, make sure you get yourself a dust mask because when you're working with these, you get fine, fine metal flakes that you can breathe in. You don't want to breathe in metal flakes. <laughs> Thank you.
Now because the motor was broken in a long time ago, I went ahead and just started pushing this bike full throttle right from the get-go. Some bumps, hill climbs, locks to torque, as much as I could give it. And this was so that if there were going to be any issues on the bike, we would find them now, hopefully. You know, as the keyway might strip out. But more importantly, we were able to set the spokes and the rag joint. See, after your first ride, as I mentioned in previous videos, you need to go back and check all the nuts on the rag joint. As they settle, the rubber shrinks moves into different positions, all sorts of things, these nuts can lose tension. Also, we want to go ahead and check the wheel and make sure it's still trued. I trued the rim after I put the rag joint on, but sometimes the spokes don't always set. And As you ride it with the weight, the speed, vibrations, the spokes will set into their final position, allowing you to get the final adjustment on the wheel for true. So we're going to go ahead and check the rag joint and the wheel. Alright, so now that we rode the bike nice and hard, we're going to go ahead and make sure that the rear wheel is still true. Whether you trued your wheel or not, maybe you got a good one and you didn't have to do anything to it, still good to check it after your first ride and your first couple of rides. Get it to a nice high point and just listen. Okay, sounds like we got two high points on there. Let's check how bad they are. Okay, those first two were not bad, but this one right here is, uh, I'm going to go ahead and adjust that one out. I know you guys probably can't see it in the camera, sorry. And then I got the dog over there with the squeaky toy. Oh, no, now you, you're done now? That's nice. Just all out there. Okay. <laughs> we trued this wheel after we put the sprocket on, but just the act of riding it, set the, the spokes. So we're going to need to true it again. Usually after that I found that the wheel just stays fine. Uh, unless you do something to tweak it, like I've done on that one several times, putting sticks through spokes and destroying derailers, that will cause the tire to go out of true, almost guaranteed. Especially since that bike's spokes are thinner than this one. I'm not going to show you guys me truing it. There's a dozen good videos out there, which would be better than anything I can make on how to true a bike wheel, I suggest you go watch them. Give them guys a thumbs up. They deserve it because they helped me. But we're going to go ahead and check these bolts now on the rag joint. And what I want to do is find the valve cap. We're going to start there. Good. Now you might think to yourself, why don't I just do like I did with the rim and just check it and make sure that the sprocket's still true instead of checking each one of these nuts individually. Well, the thing is, you can have one of these come a little loose and the sprocket will still look true when you're not riding the bike. Also, at some point in time, uh, like this one's a little looser than it should be, at some point in time you are going to have to come back to these and tighten them back up, I promise. That rubber is going to dry out, temperature is going to change, humidity is going to change, and these nuts are going to lose their tension. So, yep, see that one's good and loose. And none of these were loose when I started riding the bike. It's all about maintaining your equipment. So a lot of people like to uh, just completely trash talk these rag joints because they put them on and they expect them to work without any more user intervention. Eventually you will be able to just leave them alone, but not right after you put them on. Another thing I highly recommend when you're putting on these rag joints, if you're using the hardware that came with the kit, spray WD-40 on every single one of those studs, make sure it gets up under the nut. Uh, because these are really easy to strip out. They're like butter. Do you need your helmet? I've already put it in the car. Just the bike helmet. Nah. Nah. Alright. All right. Yeah, thank you. Alright. Yes, sir. You got it? Yeah, got it. Just as we were getting ready to go for a ride. This will be a YD100 in here.
Let me tell you guys a little story. First time she ever tried to ride a motorized bike was funny. She's bragging about how she used to ride dirt bikes, ATVs, and motorcycles. So I'm thinking, all right, well, I don't got to do much. I just, I show her how to start it. There's the gas, there's your clutch. Let off the clutch slowly, give it a little gas. And if she needs to brake, pedal backwards, right? All right, so I put her on it. She gets going down my street and she just keeps going down my street. Now I'm back at the house just watching. I don't think anything's up. She's not going really fast. Anyway, she disappears. I can't really tell what's going on. I don't think that she's out of control or nothing. Until all of a sudden I see her reappear going this way real fast. And she is just hanging on like this with her head way back and her hands out in front. <laughs> and I see her disappear off into the woods. So I get up and I don't see her, but I see some trees moving around. <laughs> just some trees and leaves shaking. And all of a sudden, this little woman with this little red bike comes pushing out of the wood. Hey buddy, did you get wet yet? Looks like you got wet. Who's a soggy doggy? Who's a soggy doggy? Alright guys, if you like this video and you like motorized bike stuff, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe because we do Friday videos every week. I think that's going to do it for today's video. See you guys next time.